everybody. Let's please welcome to the stage Freddie Wong. Hey. Hello, sir. How are you? Good. So, we've actually had Freddie on Electric Playground a few years ago. I didn't get to do the interview. We had a, a host, I think, in Los Angeles come and visit you guys. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but I've been familiar with your work and. Uh, there's a there's a, a sort of a, a thing that happened with the process of EP where we were, um, which is our, our show, we were mm -hmm. doing a lot of these skits in our programming where we'd have lightsabers and weird mm -hmm. kinds of things sort of erupt out of an interview. And then I started to see your stuff and I'm like, okay, well that shit's over. We can't do that anymore. <laughs> Look at the work this guy is doing. And so last night, you know, I knew I was gonna come here and start chatting with you today, so I wanted to kind of re-familiarize myself with some of your work, and I went down the uh, YouTube algorithm rabbit hole oh, it's a good as one. I clicked on some of your videos, and I realized that they're not, it's not really video content that you make, they're like video cookies, because you can't, <laughs> one is not enough. You just keep going, oh my God, I gotta watch another video. <laughs> is, you've, got, you've tapped into something here. You've got mm -hmm. like a secret for how to keep people connected to your material, and I don't think, it was an accident. Mm. You guys were really kind of directed on building material that was gonna hook them and keep them. Mm -hmm. Was that something that you kind of recognized you had to do early on? Yeah, you know, I think that, because I think a lot of people start talking about like, okay, what's YouTube success? How do you become popular? And it's like, you have to kind of unpack that question a little bit because I think what people define as success is gonna be different a lot of times. And so some people, like for them, success is getting tons of views, right? Hella views hella likes on Instagram or whatever that is, right? Like there's some, there's some metric sometimes that people will go for. And a lot of the times though, that doesn't necessarily mean that you will as an individual artist, individual creator, like what you're doing, right? It might not mean that even you're maybe necessarily very good at it. Like to give examples of both of those, I think when, when we first started 2010, the hip like thing, you wanna get views on your video, the easiest way to do it was you would wait for Eminem or Rihanna or any of these sort of artists to release a song and then you would say, okay, the YouTube subject line, like the, the title has a certain limit before the, the search engine cuts it off. So you write like Eminem music video, and then you put the word parody after like the part where it'll cut <laughs> off. So, a, so when people search for Eminem's new music video, the, your parody would show up and you would get a ton of clicks, right? Yeah. So I knew a lot of people were doing that because they're like, we can do that, we can put ads on it, we're gonna make money, we're getting views that way. Then none of them are doing that now because they couldn't keep up with it because it's like soul crushing. Yeah. I knew a lot of people who, you know, but it was just chasing views. And so according to that metric success, of success, they were doing fantastic. There was another group of people I knew that's like when gaming channels first started showing up, like Minecraft, everyone's like, we gotta get on Minecraft. And it's like, you don't like, I don't think you've ever played a computer game before. I don't know if you should be <laughs> like, I, like to give you an example of like, cause like we were on Minecraft early. Like this is how bad, bad it was. We were on the early, like pre-alpha and that Halloween, we were like, it was myself, Brandon, Sam and Nico, the guys from Quarter Digital. And we were like, perfect Halloween costume. We can dress as Minecraft characters. We went to so many parties where people were like, what are you guys supposed to be dressed as? Like, what are you guys <laughs> that play Minecraft? Literally the next year, everybody was like dressed as I was like, wow, we were, but like, you could do gaming, you could try and do that, but then I saw a lot of people start gaming channels and start to, start to go that route because they saw views and they saw like that's a metric of what they thought would be, they could be successful and it didn't go anywhere either because at the end of the day they weren't true blue people who really cared about that. So I think that you know, for us we were fortunate in that we kind of hit this sort of, four, sort of four Venn diagram thing I've been thinking a lot about which is like something that you know, when we started off we were doing visual effects driven action comedy videos, right? So that was something that we liked to do. We liked that kind of stuff. Like when film school, cool, uh, Truffaut, French New Wave, cool, awesome, Kurosawa, rad, also rad, Michael Bay, uh, John Woo, uh, you know, like, right, like, so we love blockbuster movies and action movies, so something we like to do. Something I think that we were pretty good at, um, cause, 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 again, that was where, where our sort of interests lie. So and this was all in film school. You were learning from some yeah. of these classic sort of elite filmmakers, but you were also We loved, and we loved, we loved the, we loved the stuff that we were doing. We, yeah. It was also something that there was thankfully an audience for because you can absolutely be doing fantastic stuff that you know like so like, like that, that that nobody sees right which so there was an audience for luckily there was teenage guys out there who liked you know action movies with visual effects fantastic and it was something that we could make a living doing right so it's kind of hitting all four of those quadrants um, and so I think that like at its core that's what we started off doing yeah. And that was fortunate because there was an audience there for it. And that's kind of, for me, the metric of success is how well you can stay 
in that sort of, you know, sort of balance amongst those four things. Well, the other thing that you touched on, though, and I, I think it's relevant, is that idea of uh, also really loving the direction that you're going into and really yeah, believing sure. in it. And I feel, yeah, I think you have to. Yeah, I feel that that's what Rocket Jump represents. Because when I see the work, and now you've got a decade's worth of your history and your energy and your production output there to see, plus all the behind the scenes, you see somebody that really is passionate about mm -hmm. what they're showing up to do every single day. Yeah, I think you have to be, you know, and I think that it's, it's at its core, you know, and I think that uh, this is my experience in film school, and I'm sure some of you folks here may even have a similar experience, which is you kind of have two types of people broadly in film school. I would say the first type are people who like to make movies, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if they're in film school, it doesn't matter if there was you know, YouTube or, not, or no YouTube or whatever, they would be making movies. And then you have people who like the idea of making movies. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, I think there's a lot of people, and in, 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 in even in my sort of own experience, who like the idea of being a director or the idea of being famous or the idea of all the other parts of the entertainment industry that gets conflated. Right. Yeah. And at, at, at its core, I think that what I've always tried to find and the people we've always tried to work with are people in the former category, people who actually just like making movies yeah. to begin with. Because I think if you just care about the latter, I don't think you make anything really that interesting and you don't really have your heart in it. You have your heart in something else. Well, um, isn't that true as well with uh, you know the technology going down in price and being so much more accessible and there are so many distribution avenues right now that it doesn't make sense to kind of you know, put all of those other things at, at the top of the importance list, you well, should be what's building, crazy is that right? makes Well, what's crazy is that makes it easier to yeah. put that stuff. You know, so I have some friends who are like, you know, they teach high school and they say that like for the first time they have, they have like, you know, the kids in their classes, they want to be YouTube famous. They mm -hmm. want to be Instagram famous. And that's it though. They just want to be famous for fame's sake. Right. And for the first time, I think you can get that. There was a, like, right, like when I was in high school, it's like the, the, I would make videos, we would play them at like the school assembly. That was like the most play that it would get. You yeah. know, the, the 400 people in my high school would be like, cool, we saw it on Tuesday morning at the assembly. Like that was the video <laughs> distribution platform. <laughs> so even like, right, like, so even like the idea of like, I remember when I was like, I was, that's, I was still even in that mindset when I was like putting YouTube videos out where it's just be like 5,000 people watch this. Like that's, that's like, 10 times bigger than my whole high school. Like that was like, the, <laughs> right? Like that's the numbers. And then when it, when it keeps going, it just becomes like inconceivable. And even in film school, like we would be like, oh yeah, if you can fill up a theater with your movie, that'd be fantastic. Like, but but the, the idea of like, oh yeah, the view counts and all of a sudden it starts to get inflated. And for the first time, I think you can be just famous for famous sake. I remember talking to a, uh, it was a, I won't name the person, but it was an Instagram, like it was a hot Instagram boy. <laughs> Right, like of which there are very many um, uh, hot Instagram Caucasian boy. Like, it's a whole subcategory. I think there's a hashtag. For it. Um, <laughs> uh, and I remember, I remember because like it, it, you know, you talk to people and you're like, oh, how'd you get started? And you talk, and I think the, the the common story on the YouTube side was like how you got started was a lot of people, you know, they said you know we were making videos and we saw that people started to watch them and start to really like them. And so we kept making them and then that sort of led us down the path. Very rarely was the answer, oh, I, I was into film and I wanted to do into production. Like that was for us, that was our story. But a lot of people who even to this day, I think are very, very prominent on the YouTube side. It starts with them starting with a passion. It was starting with them being like, I, want, I was just making stuff that I like to do and it's caught on and I kept up with it, right? Uh, Hot Instagram boy's answer was, oh, I got off the shower one day, I took a picture of myself, and I posted it. <laughs> and then it kept getting liked, so I just kept doing that. Like, That's an interesting path. Like, <laughs> so, so again, like, I think that you're getting to a point where you're, the technology right, gets easier, the cameras get better, yeah. and the skill set, in a weird way, you come at it from a different place, but it allows you to... And what's crazy, too, is like, I was talking to a photographer. He was doing like, you know, like, like portraits for, like for like a magazine, and he was talking about how... He, he had to do um, he had to do a shoot with a Instagram like makeup guru, and he was like she had a better understanding of light mm. just naturally than anybody I've ever worked with. She was like a photographer, but she didn't speak those terms. But she would sit in a room and she'd be like, "We should this is where you should take the photo from. This is where the natural is because she had done it so many times. Right? right. She had she had done it. She had put it out. She had seen the people, way people respond to it that she intuitively knew 
how to work with natural light. This even accessible though, technology is training us. Yeah, but it's training you not explicitly, it's training right. you implicitly. Like right. you're just understanding visual language in a way that you haven't before, right? Like we have, you know, like you have, you know, you read about, you know, like it's Eisenstein and all the sort of editing theory and all this stuff, and, and we read this stuff in film school, but it's the next generation of, of, uh, of folks who are coming into it, and even sort of the, the generation now, because they grew up with it so accessible, mm -hmm. they don't even have a, it's like, it's beyond language at that point. They're just speaking the language. It's like they don't have to go and study the grammar of it to get it. They just are speaking it fluently. You know? Right, right. Well, let's, let's go back a little bit here. Sure. I want to talk about sort of your first realization that you had this dream mm -hmm. to do what you're doing and kind of get an idea of where you were in your life that you said, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm going to go forward and I'm going to chase this. Yeah, so I graduated film school 2000. Eight. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good context for for that. YouTube would, had just started the partner program. There were just a few, there were Smosh and like and Michael Buckley were some of the people who were like making money on the YouTube partner program. Like ads had just shown up, and I remember people were like, "This is the end of YouTube," which by the way is going to be a refrain that I've heard now probably 20 <laughs> different times. Uh, it's the end of YouTube. Ads on YouTube, like no one will ever use YouTube again. Forget it. Right? Yeah. That was like literally at the time everybody was saying. Boycott Smosh, and no one ever is going to watch these guys again, uh, because of they had the audacity to have. By the way, not even pre-roll ads, like like uh, like ads like along the side of it. Like anyway, so at the time, you know, we I was doing a lot of, uh, direct to DVD work. You know, like I was producing direct to DVD stuff. Sam and Nico had just shot and put out a direct to DVD like horror movie. Uh, that I like did sound and music for because it was like, well, what do you guys need for this? Like, well, we don't have a sound designer and there's no composer. I'm like, I'll do that. Like, that's, you know, sort of the, the mentality that was just want to get into film and get into just working on stuff so badly. And, um, and I figured also on the producing side, like, a good movie and a bad movie, like, you still got to pay the same amount for food every day. So it's like probably the producing's the same, you know, like just the mechanics of production because I really wanted to, like, learn that. And... So at the time we were doing, we were doing you know, direct to DVD movies, which was like a hilarious. Like they're all bad movies. Like that's the whole point. Like, and also it's like you learn, you, but you learn about the mechanics of like how does a movie get made and like what are the pieces that go into it without any of the like glitz and glam of being like, oh, and this is going to be an award-winning movie and we're going to make a career from it. It's like no, no, no. Treat it if you just treat it just as a product. How do you go through it? What's right. the process for it? And you really get a good sense of it, you yeah. know, and. At the time, so like we were looking at, uh, and I remember actually, so it's 2010. I remember very distinctively because 2010, I was in Vancouver for uh, the Winter Olympics because Samsung had put out a video contest that, that year. And they were like, you can be a Samsung mobile explorer, which was basically, you can be the Samsung social media street team for free, was the, <laughs> basically the contest. Like in retrospect, that's basically what it was. But my friend was like, hey, they'll give us free tickets for the Winter Olympics, like, and we just have to make videos. Like, you know how to make videos. I'm like, yeah, I know how to make videos. Like, let's just do this. So we, I submitted it. We submitted it with my friend David and I. We were in Vancouver for, uh, uh, for the duration of the Winter Olympics, working for Samsung. And we were doing um, videos that they were gonna put up on, I think it was their, I think it was their YouTube channel or their Facebook. It was their Facebook, at, or no, no, no. It was one of their social media things, but we were in Vancouver. And I met a guy here who was also in this contest, a guy by the name of Daystorm Power, who he started off doing a lot of YouTube stuff. He's, he transitioned to Instagram, Snapchat, all, all, all that sort of stuff. And he was a YouTube partner and he was making money on it. So I remember very much just like grilling him on like, okay, how much time do you spend on this? How many views do you need to be able to make? How much money, et cetera, et cetera. Just getting all this information. He was open with it. He was like, yeah, yeah, here's how you do it. Here's how I do it. And it was enough that like by that point, it was, I, I basically called my friend Brandon, who I was, you know, uh, started the channel with. And I was like, hey, this is, we could do this. We can make money doing this and we don't have to do direct to DVD bad movies anymore. <laughs> I'm like, great. So that was essentially the start of it was when we looked at YouTube, the goal was to look at it and say, okay, can we support ourselves doing this full time? Because I think if you can't, then you're always going to be at a disadvantage. Like in the same way, like I had a friend who was a director of photography and he was working part time. I was like, it doesn't matter. I was telling him, I was like, it doesn't matter how good you are. You could be Janusz Kaminski. You're only working two days a week because five days a week you're, you're, you're doing your part time job. So it doesn't matter. You're already two and a half times less available than any other DP who's doing it full time. You have to commit to it full time if you ever, or if you really care about it. And I felt the same way about YouTube, which is like you can't beat someone doing full time if you're just going to touch it every so often. So uh, can we support ourselves? Luckily, we were living in a part of downtown LA that was cheap, the rent was shared, and it was, in retrospect, very, very bad living conditions. At the time, <laughs> didn't seem that way. 
But back then, we all, like, it was myself, Brandon, Sam, and Nico, we all slept in the same large room. And so it was five people in the room. <laughs> that sounds like prison. Well, so we had, yeah. like, well, so everyone had their corner. Okay, all right. Well, so everyone had their corner, right? Okay. So it would be, like, yeah. there, there, yeah. there, and there. Yeah. And people would, I remember the very distinct. Was there a toilet in the room? <laughs> other, other. Okay, room. Yeah. Phew. But okay. People would, <laughs> but people would come over, and they'd be like, wait, you guys all sleep in this room? Like, yeah, it's cool, right? And they'd be like, <laughs> No, like, this is insane. In retrospect, in retrospect, standing in front of your oven because it's so cold, not probably standard behavior. But yeah. at the time, we're like, great, rent is totally affordable. We can do YouTube full time. Um, so that was the goal, was to try and build an audience with it. And that was, because, you know, again, we had seen, you know, we'd seen guys like Smosh, and when there was a, a Mr. Guitar Man was huge, too. And, uh, uh, and it was one of those things where we were like, we want to just practice our craft, which is filmmaking. We want to practice it, first and foremost. We want to try out like dumb ideas, experiment with it, and then try and build an audience. With the goal of, with said audience, at some undetermined future date, that probably will be helpful if we want to do anything bigger or anything longer form. Uh, so that was, again, the sort of basic thinking that, that, that went into YouTube at the time. I hear the businessman in you. Mm -hmm. I hear that uh, you're a, a creative person mm -hmm. that has dreams to build creative videos and content, and certainly that's uh, you know, fully on display in your material. But I also understand mm -hmm. from listening to you talk about your origin story that there is someone there that really kind of wanted to figure out the nuts and bolts of, mm -hmm. of building a career and, mm -hmm. and sustaining yourself with this. Mm -hmm. And I think for this crowd right here, I think that's an important uh, thing to start talking about because you went from not just building your dreams in video form, but to actually creating your own production company. Right, right. And at, you and I had talked a little bit before this, it's a different thing to build content than it yeah. is to run a company. Talk about yeah. running and, and... I mean, I think that that's why, was, well, that's why film is interesting to me, right? Because it is, whether you like it or not, it is the intersection of art and commerce. And you, there are examples of people who only kind of think in one way, right? Like you, can, you have people who can make film a completely commercial enterprise and they make money off of it and it's like money in, money out, you know, very, very simple in that way. And you have people who are like hardcore film artist types, you know, like the brackages of the world who are like experimental and they just sort of treat it as a visual art form. But populist filmmaking and the way that I think most of us got into it, because I think most of us got into it by going to the theater and watching movies and loving, you know, Star Wars and stuff like that, as opposed to seeing like Moth Light and being like, that's what I want to do. Like, I don't think most people go to like, I, I would assume, at least in my experience, most people in film school haven't gotten into movies because they saw an experimental film at like, an art gallery, and they're like, this is what I want to do. They probably saw that they're Cineplex, right? Like, that's, that's what I think for a lot of us draws us into it. That type of filmmaking has to blend commerce and the business world and everything and the artistic side of things. And I think it's a very tempting to think, oh, but the, the business side poisons the artistic side of things, which I, I don't buy for a second because I think that that's what makes this art form interesting. That is the core of the art form. Or that the business stuff will take care of itself if you just right. go full on into your art. Right. I don't think that that works either, right? right. Like, yeah. and, it, it, and, I think it's, and I think that it's very tempting to think that. And it's very tempting to be like, oh, I can just put my vision, create a vision out there and there'll be an audience for it, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes people get lucky, and I think you can get lucky in that sense, but make no mistake about it. If that's how you're approaching it, and if you find success in that way, that's probably more luck than it is you know, anything else. Well, give, give this crowd some, some you know, hard advice, some <laughs> wisdom that you have learned about being a business person that makes uh, video I mean, I think, content. I think at, the, at its core, you need an audience, right? Like at its core, other people need to care about what you're doing. Yeah, to give you an example, like, and this is a bad example, but like the most, vi like it was, for the time, I think it held this. I think it may have, it may have lost the record at, now. But the most virally shared video of all time for a while was the Coney 2012 video. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. <laughs> have you ever thought about? But like, if you ever think about like, why is it the most virally shared video? Like, really think about that for a second. And and because I definitely was like, this is not what you would expect. I would expect that title to be held by like a Charlie bit my finger or whatever, right? Yeah. And then you think of, like, you have to, you can, you can, right? And there's really no artistic merit in the Coney 2012 video. It is, right? Like, there's not like, you can point to it and be like, ah, I mean, like, yes, there's effective filmmaking in that sense, but like, you're not looking at it and being like, ah, the cinematography or whatever, right? Like, it's not, I think it's, it's, it's tempting to think that things are a meritocracy in this world. It's tempting to think that if you make something truly great, it will do fantastic mm. and it will get what it deserves. That's not what gets passed around. What gets passed around is a much more base metric, which is does it drive people to want to share it with other people? 
right? So my big fat Greek wedding drove people to want to tell people about it and it becomes this word of mouth phenomenon. Same with the first Blair Witch Project, right? If, but if you just care about like, does it cause people to want to share it? Then yeah, Kony 12, Kony 2012 becomes the most shared video ever because intrinsic in that video is a propagandistic message that says, if you spread awareness, if you put this on Facebook, the act of sharing it, you are doing your you part. It is telling change. you that yeah. you're creating. So you get all the good feelings of like making the world a better place with no effort. Like, of course everyone clicked on that. That was so easy. Like you clicked on it and you felt good, right? It was like a dopamine hit straight to the core of your brain where it's just like, I just have to share this on Facebook and I made the world a better place. Like, heck yeah. So of course it's the most virally shared video because it's not even, it's not affecting you. Like, right, like I think a lot of things that get shared, you look at anything that gets posted around the hits top you know, of Reddit, you can point to like, why do people want to share it? It either makes you laugh you know, like the Thai uh, uh, life insurance commercials, it makes you blubber and cry in your seat, right, in the course of two minutes. Any number of these viral videos, it's like, yeah, that's why you share it. It's because it evokes an emotional reaction that causes you to want to share it with your friend, whether or not it's, you know, laughter or a jump scare or whatever, right? Like those things always have that, right? If, if you're going off of that, then yeah, then Kony 2012 is one of the most sort of virally shared videos. But the, but the, the lesson of that needs to be I've seen plenty of fantastic short films. I've seen plenty of stuff that kill at festivals, but nobody sees it. And everyone's like, well, why does nobody see this Vimeo video? It's like, well, because at the end of the day, what we understand as a metric of success here isn't artistic success. We're measuring it as, is there an audience for it, right? And I think that that's just as important as artistic success because art, you know, it's like tree falls in the forest. Like you make a fantastic short film, but nobody sees it. How good is it really, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you, do, you have to have a degree of, you know, P.T. Barnum-esque, like, showmanship for what you do. You have to want other people to see it. Uh, if, if you want to be successful in sort of a commercial sense, if you, you know, the way that you can take, that, take those reins is to approach your work and not discount the fact that just because it's popular doesn't mean it's bad. Like, at least, and I don't know if this is the case here, and if it is, I'm going to be bummed out, but it's fine because that's what happened to me in Film School too. To, like... For some reason, everybody in my, like a lot of people in my film school class when I was at USC, they hated Steven Spielberg. They're like, Spielberg is a hack. He does easy, schmaltzy shit. Nobody that, hates Steven Spielberg here, but this right? Is, uh, tell me if you guys right? heard this, but yes. tell me if you guys have okay. heard this. It's populist, it's easy. Avatar is a crap movie. It's such a dumb story. Anyone can do it. I'll tell you this though. Avatar made my mom throw up because of the 3D. She took off her 3D glasses and after the first it's 10 minutes of a movie. a ringing endorsement right there. Hold on. Okay. She took off her 3D glasses because she literally had to go to the lobby to vomit into a trash can. She came back because we were all watching Avatar. She took off her 3D glasses. She watched the rest of that three-hour movie blurry. She loved that movie. Wow. So what? So, so no, I'm sorry. Like, ringing endorsement. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's what the point of film is, isn't it? Yeah. Are we trying to reach people and we try to connect with people emotionally? She saw a blurry movie that made her throw up and she thought it was fantastic. She was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't care what you say about that movie. I don't care if it's Dances with Wolves again. It worked. Yeah. And, if, and at a certain point, you have to be pragmatic about what you're doing on, in film and saying if it works, then there's some, there is value in it. And to me... I put more value in something that works, that really affects people. Like, the, like you know, I will not say a, a lick of anything bad about Peter Jackson, King Kong, because my grandma, who does not speak English, saw it and she cried. Yeah. She was so moved by the visual storytelling. In that movie, I don't care about the other side of things. If you're able to reach someone like that, with that kind of impediment, that to me is what the core of, of filmmaking is. And if you're unable to do that, then you can't shit on other people who can. That's my. That's all I'm saying. So this, <laughs> this is the uh, the marvelous thing about uh, getting to know you a little bit, yeah. because I, I hear this uh, respect for the the emotional connection right, and right. the human quality uh, in storytelling. And when you watch your videos on the surface level, there's just so much manic, chaotic mm -hmm. action, and you're you're a kick-ass fighter for some reason too. <laughs> I don't know how you do all this stuff, but there is just this 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 carnage in your movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's also always a commitment there mm -hmm. and a story there and, a, and humans there. And mm -hmm. I think of Mexican standoff and the mm -hmm. dialogue that you're, you're going back and forth with Key and Peele, who are mm -hmm. both brilliant as well. And it all just feels solid and real. And 
it's crazy and ridiculous, but you ground it in something that, that you do, you're invested all the way through. And then you take it to another level and you're like, holy shit, I didn't know we were going there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think that you have you know, a really consummate writer's kind of connection to all of this stuff. There's, there seems to be a deep-seated respect with the, the idea of being committed all the way through in your storytelling. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, think, I don't think we arrive at that naturally every time, right? I think we've found our way to it because I think at our core, because we try to sum up like what is it about our videos that, we, that has a connective tissue to it. And I think at our core, we 100% buy into our own premises. Like we are not cynical or are sarcastic about what we're doing, mm. about our own premise, right? We don't undercut ourselves in that way. And I think that there are examples, by the way, of our videos where we do kind of like poke fun at ourselves or poke fun at that underlying concept and they don't work. Right. I think the videos that 100% embrace what we're trying to do and do it unironically, is, 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 those are the best examples of, of, I think, our work, you know? So, you know, when we say something like Key and Peele, like the Mexican standoff video, which is like, at its core, the idea for that came from, it's a, you know, your standard John Woo, like two guys pointing guns at each other, Mexican standoff. Okay, but let's buy into it 100%. Let's escalate that to an, an absurd logical like thing. And then it goes so far that the only joke that remains is is be like, "Yep, they're in a world, they're in a magical world where this is a, right like the punchline of that is, you know, for some people like I think that their favorite part of it is the punchline is, "No, this was a gigantic build up because they they're they're wizards. They're in a magical wizard world because that's the only thing that makes sense after we get to this logical extreme." And I think we've seen that a lot of times, even in like you know, in like video game high school across yeah. the three seasons. It was like as time went on, like we went to insane places with that show, and it's places that I'm very proud of going because it's like, yeah, why not? Like, shouldn't this, shouldn't the form of this follow the the crazy premise that we have? But you can never get there, I don't think, uh, unless you 100% buy into and believe in uh, what you're doing. And the moment you start to undercut it, I think that people. I think that people are, you know, I mean, it's easy to be sarcastic about stuff. It's easy to just find that everywhere. Well, yeah, and the audience is going to bring that to the table yeah, almost every know? time anyways. Yeah, right? and so yeah. I think, like, that's, and, and that's why to me, like, I think, and that's, and this is, again, because I think there's a lot of ways of approaching film. There's a lot of ways of approaching that sort of creative work. To me, that's what's interesting to me is when people are genuinely bought into it. That's why I love, for example, like, the Step Up movies, right? Mm. I love all the Step Up movies because when you watch, watch those movies, like, I can forgive all the various, you know, because again, I'm sitting there as a, you know, as a filmmaker, as a story guy, being like, oh, this is not, maybe not the right way to do whatever. I forgive all of that because they're so earnest about the yeah. premise and their belief that it's like dance can change the world. Well, La La Land was like that too, right? It was like a, a full see, commitment. Say, but see, I would say, La, but like at the same time though, I think La La Land, I'm not sure of, right? Like right. I would say to me, the thing that bummed me the most out about La La Land was it took attention away from what I believe a much superior musical that year, which was a, a movie called Sing Street mm. by John Carney, which right, was a that director was once. Yeah. And to me, that's the perfect, to me, by the way, like as a, as a study, to me, the perfect double feature and example of like a story and a character that under, like, like to me, like, I mean, again, who, who, who here seen Sing Street? See, this is, this is the problem, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not kidding. This was my favorite movie of last year because it's a movie about everything in La La Land thematically except dramatized and characterized in a much more real way and the music is like a thousand times better. But that's aside because it's John Carney. But yeah. like, just, just if, if there's nothing else you get from it, go see Straight Sing Street. Like, get it off iTunes. It's, I think it's on Netflix. It is far and away like... Every, to me at least from that mindset that mindset of like earnestness and like believing in what you're doing it is like everything that like La La Land aspired to be mm. but I think fell short of they did in Sing Street and they did it like to a degree where it's like I like, to me it's such a night and day difference between those two movies that are dealing with similar themes you know and I think it's always fun to be able to find that because again I don't I think that I think the technical filmmaking is in, 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 in La La Land was fantastic right, right. Like from a cinematography standpoint the color like all that stuff I loved it mm -hmm. um, but in other aspects I'm like I think Sing Street's a superior movie you know so it, it really and that's what's kind of fun about movies and film right because bet you weren't uh, expecting a criticism of La La Land today from <laughs> Freddie Wong right but to me that's <laughs> this but is to amazing me, but to me like but but to me like that's what's fun about movies right it's yeah. like because like I love both of those movies but for different reasons yes. and I can't say that one is necessarily better than the other I can say I think one did different things better than the other right so it's no such thing as this black and white like this is a better movie this is a worse movie it's it's more I appreciate these two for different things and to me Sing Street does so much uh, that that touched on sort of similar worlds and it cuts it cuts to that core of what I think for me at least 
uh, as, a, as a creator, the filmmaker, I think is important, which is, which is that earnestness and that approach that is uncynical and is as, as, as genuine as possible. And the musical, I think, really represents that, right? I mean, you for have sure, to go sure. full out to, to get a musical on, on film. Are you, is that in you? Is, that, is there a musical in your future? Oh, is I think it? so. I mean, we were, yeah. cause, I mean we, were, we were talking about being in high school, like, because uh, we have a hint of it in this third season where Joanna, uh, who's on you know, Quantico and, and, and tons of shows now, but the person who played Jenny Matrix, she, uh, she, she was like a tr classically trained like opera singer. So mm. we have a scene where she's singing opera, yeah. and, and that is her, like 100%. That is her singing opera. Uh, and we were like, we have to do a musical episode. We were trying to figure out like what, because I think a lot of the fun with Video Game High School was we started to break down the the form of a show, like the genre, started to become something we played with fundamentally, which I think genre is just as much an element of film as sound design or cinematography or whatever. So we started using genre as a, as a joke mm. and as, as a way of like getting to the core of things. So for example, you know, we have an episode that, you know, uh, spoilers for those of you who haven't seen it, but my character dies, right? And it's a very important thing for the character of Ted to grow up and like it's, a, it's an important moment for him. But we're like, this is gonna like. Here's how we can do the genre of this. We'll use the first part's gonna play as a comedy, and we'll use three camera sitcom as a genre. And then when I and then when the moment happens, we're switching and pulling all of that away to be very realist, very straightforward, like almost documentary esque filmmaking for that moment for the rest of the episode. So halfway through the episode, we want to switch genre. And what we were trying to get at with that was to say, it's it's two things. One. For, you know, because I think what was one of the things that was we were speaking to there was personally, we all had had friends in high school, Matt, myself, Will, had known people who either their parents died or had a death in the family and how that affected them. And it wasn't necessarily us, but we were, we understood and sort of felt that. And we wanted to try and capture that. And in a weird way, the most honest way of capturing that to me was it was this sort of mix of like everything before that moment feels trivial and surreal and almost like false. So we want to represent that by showing the moments before that as this three camera sitcom with a laugh track and like kind of goofy slapstick sort of dialogue back and forth. And it this and that sort of that duality of those two realities spoke to the core of that emotional truth that we were trying to get at, which is what happens when your close friend has a family member who dies and how do you even support them and how do you deal with that, you know? And and so that was again, and I think that that's the fun of filmmaking is being able to be experimental. And I don't think you get there if you think the premise of a high school where everyone plays video games is a schlocky premise. Yeah, You don't get to that point. You yeah. get to something else, which I don't think is interesting. Well, I don't know if you get to that point without the path that you took either. I think that a lot of filmmakers have to kind of work really hard to find that level of autonomy in the traditional sort of distribution sphere that, that exists out there. Mm -hmm. But you tapped into this you know, uh, ability and this opportunity with YouTube and, and the various partners that you've had over the years to be able to kind of carve your own path. I want to talk a little bit about your process. Sure. Do you approach all of this stuff with the, the way that you were trained in film school? Or did mm -hmm. you throw all of that out the window and say, no, we're going to start it this way? Are you a visualist? Because you mm -hmm. obviously have a real sense of how, mm -hmm. you know, the end frame is going to be. But do you mm -hmm. start with the script and, and, you know, do you control all of that before you... Yeah, you yeah. go to put anything in front of the camera. How, yeah. do, how do you do it? So I think that it, it comes from a lot of places, and it depends, right? So some of, sometimes a lot of the short YouTube videos will come from a place of, here's a really funny image, a really funny joke. Like I remember Serial Killer, which was a, 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 that, and it was a, it was a short action thing about like me in a supermarket stopping, stopping like bad guys robbing it, like unwittingly stopping them. There was like two images that, that spawned that. One was the idea of like, someone in a refrigerator like hiding as someone walks by like com like literally frozen in place as they go by I was like that's really funny and then two the idea of like then two the idea of like projectile milk vomiting is like really funny um, <laughs> so those are like two images that we had so like, okay how can we get from eight and then also and then like as we and then so so that was the two images that started with that it wasn't like character it wasn't like story it was okay here we are I'm trying to decide between two cereals and like the punchline of this very very dumb joke is that no matter which cereal you I pick it causes me the projectile vomit, right <laughs> So that has nothing to do with it. So we were shooting it, and then as we were doing it, we came up with more images. The idea of like, oh, the, 
the reflector plates in uh, in in in, um, in supermarkets. Like that'd be cool as a way of like seeing where someone is, so that you could do a gunshot. And then we started thinking about okay, how do you show that geographically and make that make sense? So this wasn't in the script. You were shooting things. So that was shooting. That was okay. over the course of like a single night. You okay. know, that's like probably one of the best examples of a movie that we did that was like a 24 hour. Like in the, it was if it was a 24 hour movie festival contest, that would be the movie that wow. we would do because we literally came up with the idea, went out and shot it, and finished it in about 18 hours time. Like from that night to that morning was because we were late. Because we were like, we have to get a video out this week. We're, we don't. It's Tuesday. We upload on Thursday. We need to come up with something. We knew somebody who had a, who had, a, who had a, uh, their family owned a, a supermarket, and we're like, can we come shoot here tonight? And that was like literally it. It was like that, that kind of turnaround. That's incredible. Um, other things like you know, for for story and 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 for anything that has sort of story and character, we definitely start from the script phase, hundred percent. Mm. Um, Is that always you? Uh, that is myself, mostly actually, honestly, my, my co-founder Matt and Will, who are, I think, you know, ca who understand character and story, I think, to a crazy, crazy, crazy degree. And, I, and I, we, we just started a podcast uh, called Story Break, and the, and the premise of the podcast is what we do is we try and we take a movie or a concept that we have no rights to. So, for example, the second episode we did, I think it's probably a good idea to give you an idea of like kind of what our process is like and the thinking that goes into it. We we're like, all right, if we let's say let's say Disney came to us and said, you guys need to make the Jar Jar Binks movie. <laughs> okay, where do you, how do you do it? And so and so we go into it, and then so this is a podcast. We just we we put out a new episode every week, and so that was like the second episode. I think I think we come up with a great Jar Jar Binks movie because we get we try because you'll hear it like we get into character. We're like, okay, well, what is what is Jar Jar? Who is he? Like, he's kind of a tragic figure if you think about it, right? Because he gets manipulated by Palpatine to like order the death of all the Jedi. Like, he he puts Palpatine in the power, but he doesn't do it willingly. And so we get into like, what is his, what is the character there? How do you redeem that? Like, he would feel guilt. How can he how can he redeem himself as a character? And then literally we tie it into it's like, wait a minute, it's like. Did, like part of the point of the podcast, we're like, wait, Jar Jar swore a life debt to Qui Gon Jinn, who died. He failed in his life debt to the guy who saved his life. Like, there's all these character things here that we all just skipped because we're like, oh, Jar Jar sucks. It's like, no, there's an amazing character arc that's waiting to be dug up from Jar Jar Binks, where he can become this hero <laughs> at the end of it. I think we have a fantastic Jar Jar movie idea. Oh, oh. I'm not kidding when I say, like, if they ask us, I'm like, I have an idea for a Jar Jar movie, and by the end, I promise you, you will cry for the death of <laughs> because of the uh, because of where, where you take it. Well, maybe he's on the other side though. Maybe he's he's part of the dark side. So that's where so that's where it comes because you realize yeah. that's what it is with him is that yeah. he, he realizes. He realizes, How did we get on a Jar Jar Binks? <laughs> what here's the what hell? it is. No, no, no. Here's what it is. Here's what it is. Here's what it is. Right? He realizes that, like, so you know, he he realizes that, like, his friend Anakin, who he knew as a kid, turns to Darth Vader. Like, he realizes that, like, he's being manipulated, but he's this guy who who can who can who can push through. Right? He's always been this like happy-go-lucky character, so he has goodness within him. So he starts to so he plays this double agent where he has to undercut the Empire and the Emperor himself. Right, because every he, he emperor thinks that he's just some dumb lackey who will just do whatever he wants. But he tries to he starts to work with the rebel alliance, and he realizes anyway. The point is that it gets to the point where <laughs> the point is this, right? He you just just listen to it. Point is, <laughs> Jar, there's a character there, and I think when we approach stuff and we approach our work, we approach it the same way. So we're like, oh, okay, like you know, what is we really try and get to what makes people tick, and what, what and we'll spend like. A psychotically long amount of time I sense trying to break that. A, a mad love and respect for George Lucas in you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, me too. So, Freddie, we are in the uh, the visual effects capital of the world in Vancouver, and of course, the Vancouver Film School has a brand new performance capture studio. And I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, your thoughts on the visual effects industry. I know there's probably some visual effects artists in the room right now. What do you think about visual effects as, as it pertains to the future of? of filmmaking and, and uh, game making and all kinds of things. Tough, tough industry right now, I'll yeah. tell you that. Because a lot of the economics of that industry are subject to the whims of governments, right? Like a lot, it's, right? Like a lot of stuff happens in Canada because there's fantastic tax credits here, right? right? Um, it, so it's a difficult industry uh, because it's a service-based industry and I think it doesn't get, it, and it also has grown to encompass pretty much every frame of a modern movie gets touched at some point. Uh, through that process, so I, I think that you know, I think that with with regards to that world, 
I was interested. I was really interested. That, I don't remember again. This is bad. I don't remember the company, but you know, they uh, when they did um, Ender's Game, right? There was sort of a partnership there between the visual effects studio and the and the production company, and I think that at its core, a service based industry is going to always have a lot of difficulties because there's a lot of things outside of. Uh, the you know the whims of the world and governments and tax credits and all that stuff is going to be subject to those to be battered about by that you know and I think that where it goes is it gets to places where those those places realize I think that they have a lot of the ability to make the look of stuff and the focus needs to start to go into okay what well, about their own IP creation their own content creation right. and and that side of things which is you know, I think a different discipline because I think that you can. There's a there are plenty of exa examples of VFX folks who give a give a you know give a movie their, a, a shot and they don't and that movie's not that good. I think you know there's and there's and you have like you know the the counterpoint to that is you have a guy like Neil Blomkamp who's gonna do District Nine and you're like oh here's a guy who has a heavy VFX background right. marrying that with a, you know with 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 you know the with Jackson and everybody on, on sort of District Nine. You're like oh this is that final result and that's something that's really compelling and interesting and speaks to a price point that I think things need to get to nowadays, right? Like, I think that, I think that the amount of money that people spend on, on just movies in general probably is going to be heading down as time goes on because there's so many other things that people can entertain themselves with, right? Like, sort of supply and demand, uh, basically. So, I think it's a hard industry, but I think that those, those skill sets, what I found at least is those skill sets and that, because visual effects requires you a deep understanding of the image mm. and... Not just from a compositional uh, like standpoint, but from a like elements and z depth and like just the understanding of, like what goes into like a, a visual effects shot. You have to be able to think that way. I think if you want to be a, a director, right? You can't just be like. I think it's 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 too wasteful to be like, eh, we'll shoot this, we'll throw some green up, and we'll just they'll just the CG guys will do it later, right? right. Like you save yourself. We've saved ourselves even just tons and tons and tons of time and money by saying things like, all right, let's design this shot nodally because we know that that's going to be less of an effect. Can we get away with doing this part 2D versus 3D versus full 3D sim? Here's, what are ways we can cheat it? What are ways we can cheat it in a cut to not have to just constantly just push push that creative process off? The more you understand that, the more I think cost effective you can make uh, you can make what you're doing. And I think that making cost effective work is going to become more and more important as time goes on because I think the people who are able to do $200 million, $300 million movies is going to be less and less. So you've got a room filled with, uh, with dreamers here right now. Sure. And you've been a guy that's been multidisciplined and has been able to float from one job that's been necessary in a project to another job that's been necessary in a different project. Is that kind of what you recommend to people that are you know, wanting to do or wanting to emulate or wanting to sort of achieve their goals in, in this sort of creative space? Yeah, I think I think so. I think that like multidisciplinary approach is going to be is a better one for the modern age. I, you always hear the phrase, all right, jack of all trades, master of none. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever says the third part of that phrase, which is part of it, which is which is oft better than a master of one. So you are that that, that phrase is saying that like, you should be a jack of all trades. Uh, that is better than just having only one. And I think these days that is that is the case. And I found that it's been helpful for me. Just because, you know, I think especially when you first come out and you're looking for work, it's much harder to just go exactly into what you're doing. If you're more versatile, you're able to work with more people. By working with more people, you have more connections. As time goes on, those connections help, you know. So, like, when I started out, it was just literally anything and everything. I was helping out people doing titles. I was helping out people with websites. I was doing, for Sam Nico's, you know, first, you know, uh, direct-to-DVD feature, I was doing... I was like, sure, I know how to do music composition and sound design, and I'll learn Pro Tools, and I'll figure that out, and I'll do the mix for you guys. And, and again, like that was, and, and, and I'll tell you, in the course of that, I learned pretty much everything I know from After Effects and everything from Sam and, and, and Nico themselves, because I was just in the room, in the room with them, and asking questions and trying to be helpful. You know? And I think you can be helpful by having as many, as many sort of you know, skill sets under your belt as possible. And I think that, you know, when, when the, to me, when you go out and into that world, the, the most important thing, the most important thing, I think, is to, is to realize that, you know, this is not an art form that you can make just by yourself. If it was, you should have either become a writer or a painter or any number of the different art forms where just you can solo cue that all day. If you, however, when I think with filmmaking, it is fundamentally collaborative and you have to be able to build a network of people that you work with, whether you like that or not. If you're a little bit antisocial like me, you still have to do it, right? Like you still need people to help you out with things and you still need to be able to trust other people to, to bring their voice to the table. And that's the fun, to me, that's the fundamental nature 
uh, the art form. And I think the sooner you can embrace that, the easier of a time you'll have when you, when you get out there. Freddie, it's been an honor talking with you. Absolutely. Learned a lot, Thanks. and uh, you are an incredibly talented individual. I think you're a hell of an actor, and it's surprising. <laughs> I really do, because uh, you really sell your work in all of these videos that you're in, and I, it's surprising to me that I, we don't see you in lots of other projects just as an actor. You're really, really great, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's a lot, I don't think there's a, lot of, uh, a, a market for mediocre-looking Asian guys. I, yeah, <laughs> well, that's, that, that's why it is so amazing. You, like, you go over the top and sell it. But listen, you've got a lot of really, uh, we could talk for hours. You've got a lot of really profound and awesome things to share. And it's been my honor to, uh, to host you here at the Vancouver Film School today. Thank you so much. Freddie Thank you Wong. very much. Appreciate it.